So today, or tonight rather, we're gonna do a little bit of a exploration through perianal tumors and urogenital tumors or butts and bladders. I have to thank one of my mentors from Ohio State, Megan Brown, who uh, used to do this rounds topic with the students. So thought it was a kind of good topic for us to kind of sink our teeth into. So, um, I just wanted to maybe start off with a little clinical example of some kind of interesting cases for each of these talks. So this handsome fella here is Winston. Winston's a nine-year-old male neutered lab. Um, he initially presented to his primary vet up in the Washington DC area for a left-sided anal sac mass and having signs of PUPD. At that time, they found out he was hypercalcemic and, and he had metastatic disease to the sacral lymph node. This was back in September of last year. He then went to a local veterinary surgeon up that way and had the lymph node extirpated and the left-sided anal sac mass removed, um, which they then noted an improvement in his hypercalcemia. Shortly thereafter, a resident man of mine actually happened to see the dog and start him on carboplatin chemotherapy up in DC. Unfortunately, pretty shortly thereafter, he developed recurrence of the anal sac mass as well as the, the metastatic lymph node and, and his hypercalcemia was noted to increase at that time back in November of 2021. So uh, the owner then unfortunately was going through a divorce and, and moved um, here to, to Nashville, bringing Winston along for the trip. He came in to see us on emergency, unfortunately during that process, and he was noted to be a toxic anor and anorexic. He had a four centimeter left-sided multilobulated anal sac mass as well as enlarged and firm um, superficial iliac lymph nodes, as well as um, some, some suspect deeper lymph nodes on rectal palpation. He was uh, hypercalcemic, and at that time, the ionized calcium was 2.5. I put in the reference range there, just because depending on where you've trained or where you send off your samples to, that, that range can vary a little bit lab to lab, but pretty significantly elevated. Chest radiographs were done at that time, and no pulmonary metastatic disease was observed. And he was started on intravenous fluids um, and was continued on his previous dose of prednisone. So he got transferred to us the next morning with time and fluids. His ataxia was noted to have improved um, and his ionized calcium improved mildly, but, but still remained pretty elevated. We increased his steroids and sent him home shortly thereafter. He came back a few days later to see us and was reported to have been much improved at home. However, that ionized calcium was still pretty elevated. Uh, we did an abdominal ultrasound just to get some baseline measurements of the enlarged lymph nodes kind of in the area of the prepuce as well as the, the sublumbar nodes. And you can see here some of the baseline measurements of the sublumbar lymph nodes. At that time, he was given a dose of zolidronate, which is a, a bisphosphonate, um, to try to help with the hypercalcemia. And we started him on palladia, which we're going to talk more about here in a little bit. So while not maybe the focus of our talk, um, I just wanted to do a quick aside about bisphosphonates because I think they're pretty interesting and can be pretty clinically useful. Bisphosphonates are inorganic pyrophosphates that are given to people and, and dogs to inhibit osteoclasts and to help reduce pathologic bone resorption. They are commonly used for the management of hypercalcemia and malignancy in dogs as well as to help um, with palliation and particularly pain in dogs with bone tumors. Uh, the most commonly used bisphosphonates are pimidronate and zolidronate in, in dogs. Pimidronate being a second generation bisphosphonate and zolidronate being a third generation. Uh, folks have started to gravitate a little bit more towards the zolidronate since it's a much easier drug to administer and that's given IV over 15 minutes instead of over two to four hours. It's also a uh, hundred times more relatively potent compared to the pimidronate. So um, just a few comments about uh, these drugs is, you know, really they're a really useful tool in dogs with um, uh, appendicular osteosarcoma with a uh, focus on trying to keep them as comfortable as possible. Dr. Fan, who's really the, um, a, a really big researcher on uh, bisphosphonates in dogs, did a prospective study back in 2007 with pimidronate, where he looked at pimidronate administration with NSAIDs for management of canine osteosarcoma um, discomfort, and they found that about a third of dogs had improvement um, in discomfort with this, uh, administration of this pimidronate. And it was fairly durable, you know, lasting about eight months or so. Um, so definitely a tool in our arsenal. 
kind of a, a unique drug specific side effect that we don't talk about all that often um, and is more uh, well described in humans is this bronze or bisphosphonate related osteonecrosis of the jaw. It's seen in one to 2% of human cases um, or cases where uh, bisphosphonate's administered. The pathogenesis isn't really well understood. However, it's suspected to be resultant from defects in uh, jawbone remodeling or wound healing. Um, there was a single case here described in a St. Bernard by Dr. Fan, unsurprisingly, in a dog that had an osteosarcoma and was given zolidronate for 46 consecutive months. So while really rare, kind of a, a unique drug specific side effect, we just kind of keep our eye on. Um, there's also a, a recent publication here by the group out at University of California at Davis that uh, was retrospectively looking at the incidence of acute kidney injury uh, associated with zolidronate. Um, since we know it happens in humans and we kind of were, uh, monitor uh, dogs for that same uh, problem, 14% of dogs in this one retrospective study were found to have acute kidney injury secondary to zolidronate administration. So really now to, to get back to the focus of our talk, um, I wanna take some time to talk about perianal tumors in dogs and a little bit in cats. Um, the main areas of focus we're gonna to have today are um, perianal adenomas and adenocarcinomas, which are, are tumors that arise from the circumanal glands in the dermis and um, tumors that arise from the anal glands themselves within the anal sac, like anal gland, anal sac adenocarcinoma, and then less commonly seen squamous cell carcinoma and malignant melanoma. You can see any sort of cutaneous or subcutaneous tumor arise from the perianal area in dogs. So things like mast cell tumors, lipomas, soft tissue sarcomas, you know, hemangiosarcoma, lymphoma, and, and TBT. You know, for whatever reason, as a resident, I had a, a run of these perianal lipomas, which was something I, I hadn't really um, seen or read much about. And it was funny, I had a case with one of my mentors, Dr. Bill Kisseberth, and I kept poking this, this mass near the butt, you know, two or three different times and kept just getting fat. And I said, Dr. Kisseberth, I must be doing something wrong. I, I can't find out why I uh, keep getting fat on this. And a very dry sense of humor looks over and said, did you ever think your dog just has a fat ass, which I found pretty funny, but um, suffice it to say, you know, you can see things like lipomas or mast cell tumors or any other cutaneous or subcutaneous tumor arise from the, the perianal area as well. So perianal adenomas are the most common perianal tumor in dogs. Um, again, they arise from the circumanal gland. Uh, common breeds that we see this in are cocker spaniels, beagles, bulldogs, and some moyads. These are tip, uh, benign tumors that are often pretty slow growing. They appear to be um, dependent on sex hormones and are, are really common in intact older male dogs um, and in female dogs are almost exclusively seen in, in dogs that have been spayed. You can rarely see them in, in female dogs secondary to uh, production of androgenic steroid hormones from the adrenal glands and particularly in, in female dogs with Cushing. So we always um, talk about the potential of these dogs having adrenal nodules or adrenal masses as well or you know, some sort of Cushing's. So um, I provided some uh, cytologic images here as well. Perianal adenomas are also affectionately known as hepatomas since they have a really classic cytologic appearance of liver, um, liver cells. So you can see here kind of a, a more gross picture of these cells and a, a more magnified image. And it kind of has that classic you know, liver appearance. Just for fun, I put in an actual liver cytology photo here just to show how similar these hepatomas or perianal adenomas can appear cytologically um, to normal canine liver. So you can have kind of single or multiple perianal adenomas occurring. These are usually smaller lesions measuring somewhere between half a centimeter to three centimeters in diameter. Often just like this picture here kind of denotes they arise from the hairless skin around the anus and, and typically appear pretty well circumscribed. Um, typically, they're treated with marginal surgical excision and castration if you have an intact male dog. Greater than 90% of these dogs are cured, particularly male dogs, with neuter and marginal excision of the mass, though they certainly can uh, recur or develop de novo lesions. Um, a lot of other different treatments have been evaluated in these um, perianal adenomas like electrochemotherapy, radiation, hyperthermia, cryotherapy and all have been described to have pretty decent um, response rates. Um, electrochemotherapy in particular, um, for those who, who went to my last talk I did a few months ago, 
has a pretty high response rate of greater than 90% with 65% of the 65% having complete responses. So definitely something worth uh, considering in, in uh, select cases. So in contrast to perianal adenomas, perianal adenocarcinomas are a malignant tumor of the perianal gland. These are less common um, and they're not hormon hormonally dependent. These typically affect large to giant breed dogs and tend to be a lot more rapidly growing and, and have more of a firm feel and are more fixed to the deeper tissues. Compared to perianal adenomas that are benign, these can be metastatic. And in one study from 1990, less than 15% were found to be metastatic at the time of diagnosis, which unsurprisingly being a carcinoma, you know, the local regional lymph nodes are really the metastatic site most often observed. So um, one key thing to take away from this is it can be really challenging to differentiate a perianal adenoma from a perianal adenocarcinoma, um, despite kind of those gross differences I just mentioned. Often definitive diagnosis and, and histopathology are, are needed to really determine 100% um, the, the difference occasionally. And there's actually one study looking at the use of immunohistochemistry to, to really help elucidate that as well, um, just like the Ad, um, perianal adenomas, they can be single or multiple. You can have irritation of the perineum, pain, obstruction secondary to enlarged lymph nodes um, in, in these sorts of cases. Typically, thoracic and abdominal imaging is indicated to look for any sort of local regional or distant metastatic disease. Treatment, um, you know, when there's a chance to cut, there's a chance to quote unquote cure, but often surgery is the treatment of choice, though the, the surgical dose is. is more so than perianal adenomas based on the more malignant nature of this tumor type. And there is a risk of local recurrence or post-op metastasis. However, the percentage of this aren't, aren't super worked out and it's probably an area where further research is needed. Certainly radiation and chemotherapy are, are treatment modalities that can also be considered in these cases. However, their, their real role is not really well understood. Um, in tumors that are, you know, relatively small, where surgery is, is a tenable treatment option, you know, these can have pretty good um, control rates and dog, the two-year control rates reported to be about 60%. However, if metastatic lesions are present, the median survival time unsurprisingly decreases to six months or so. So um, to then transition to um, really the, the major focus of, of this talk here, um, anal sac, anal gland adenocarcinoma, affectionately, you know, our alga sac is a, is a pretty common and, and malignant tumor. Reported to be 17% of perianal masses based on um, some epidemiologic data, though interestingly, I feel like I see these a lot more commonly than I do the perianal adenocarcinomas. Um, there is some, some data to suggest that it may be associated with neutering of male dogs. Really the overrepresented breeds are your Cocker Spaniels, your Alaskan Malamutes, German Shepherd Dogs, and your Dachshunds. Uh, typically these are middle-aged to older dogs, so they've been reported in, in you know, a dog as young as five years old. Um, they can be unilateral or bilateral. And in, in one study that was up to 14% of cases actually being bilateral in nature. So you know, it's always good to, to feel the mass, but then also feel the other anal sac just to, to see if that's also enlarged. Uh, there's quite a few different histopathologic gross appearances that have been described, um, though the kind of significance clinically is still kind of yet to, to really be known. So just to mention, um, there is a, a fairly well worked down and understood um, uh, staging system for Agasaka and dogs, just to, to mention, um, you know, stage one is the primary tumor is less than 2.5 centimeters. Your stage two disease is where that primary tumor is greater than 2.5 centimeters. Then your stage three is when you have um, local regional lymph node metastasis, either less than 4.5 centimeters or this 3B greater than 4.5 centimeters. And then your stage four is any sort of distant metastatic disease that's, that's present. So as I'm sure you guys are familiar, Agasaka in dogs has a, what's called a perineoplastic hypercalcemia present in 15 to 53% of these cases. Um, the tumor tissue actually produces PTH-related uh, peptide production um, from the, the tumor. Um, you, this is a useful biomarker in these patients and it should resolve with treatment and can be monitored serially for either recurrence or metastasis. <clears throat> 
So when we talk about um, these tumors, they're, they're really uh, a pain in the butt because they're both really can be pretty locally aggressive tumors, but also have a penchant for metastasis, um, particularly through the, the lymphatic system. So um, this is just a picture I stole from online looking at the kind of um, lymphatics and the caudal abdomen. And, you know, often it's easiest for my brain to think about things moving in a fairly linear progression. You know, if this is going to metastasize, it would go to the, the sacral lymph node and then the hypogastric and then the medial iliac. However, based on some newer lymphatic um, studies in, in these cases, they found that the sacral lymph node was actually only the sentinel lymph node in about a quarter of cases. So you can have cases where they have skip metastasis and through some of the complexities of lymphatic drainage, it can jump up to the hypogastric or the iliac lymph nodes. So I think it's just a, a really good um, point to make to say, um, it's really important to evaluate all these lymph nodes in pretty um, significant detail just to get a baseline um, to try to help make the, the best treatment plan possible for these cases. So unfortunately, metastasis is really common and it's pretty frustrating, but whenever you read the introduction of one of these papers, they write a metastatic rate of 26 to 96% at the time of diagnosis, which I don't know, when I see a number, a range that, that big, you're kind of like, well, what is it really? That, that's pretty major extremes of the spectrum there. But you know, suffice it to say, a lot of these cases can be metastatic at the time of diagnosis. You know, in particular, you know, lymph node mets are, are pretty common and, and even distant mets have been reported in zero to 42% of cases at the time of diagnosis. Distant metastatic sites most commonly observed are the lungs, liver, spleen, bone, and then kind of other less common um, ones as well. The, the interesting but also frustrating facet of this tumor is it's really variable with respect to its biology and its behavior. You know, for instance, you can have a small primary tumor and then start looking under the hood and finding really advanced stage disease in bones or lymph nodes or the lungs. Or you can have a, a, a large, potentially non-resectable primary tumor without any sort of metastatic disease present. So each case is a, a little different and it's just a, kind of a, a treasure hunt for, for metastatic lesions from a staging perspective. Uh, folks have looked at a lot of different things that may be associated with metastasis, particularly with respect to histopathology and, and things that have been associated with metastasis include a solid histologic pattern, lymphatic or vascular invasion, peripheral invasion of the tumor into their surrounding tissue, or loss of something called e-cadherin expression, which e-cadherin is a, a junctional um, adhes adhesion molecule that um, when that uh, uh, Pre the presence of e-cadherin is lost, a lot of those cells can develop a more uh, metastatic phenotype and, and spread throughout the body. <clears throat> so some common kind of clinical signs we see in these cases are, you know, one, they're found incidentally that either, you know, we're, we find it on rectal exam before it's causing an issue or the groomer serendipitously finds it, you know, whether the, the owner or, or we notice a perianal mass whether or not there's you know, any sort of anal discharge or perianal swelling, scooting, or irritation of the, the perineum. You know, we definitely can see these cases unfortunately present with obstruction. Um, often this is secondary to um, actually lymph uh, really large lymph nodes compressing the colon rather than the perianal masses themselves causing obstruction. You know, it's pretty amazing. You can see some, some really, really large tumors and, and these dogs actually be able to defecate okay and other really small tumors where you know, they just have rock and lymph nodes that, that really are causing most of the tenesmus and issues. And also, you know, we can see signs secondary to hypercalcemia, such as vomiting, lethargy, or being PUPD. So, um, you know, some, some diagnostics and, and considerations from a diagnostic perspective is presence of a firm mass in the, the anal sac, particularly at the four and eight o'clock um, positions. Um, you know, doing a, a fine needle aspirate, aspiration is always a really good idea in evaluating the cytology just to help rule out the presence of any sort of impaction, infection, or inflammation, and then some sort of staging, including thoracic and abdominal imaging, as well as evaluating, um, you know, the, the calcium levels, particularly with focus on the ionized calcium. You can see here is a CT scan from a patient, and here's a really large lymph node kind of going down and compressing on the colon. So again, um, the, just some cytologic images to discuss with Agasaka. They're, they're pretty slides and they often carry a neuroendocrine appearance. 
Um, it's often described as the nucleus, a small nucleus floating in a sea of cytoplasm, and it has a, a very much epithelial cytologic appearance. So you can see these kind of clusters of cells um, together with these very classically neuroendocrine um, kind of appearance to them. So if you ever want to hear some veterinary medical oncologists have a spirited discussion, um, particularly over a drink or two, you know, bringing up with a few of them, whether they'd like to stage with abdominal ultrasound or CT scan for, for Agasac is always a, a good conversation starter. Um, you know, it's, it's important to try to identify any sort of nodal metastasis and certainly a, a real practical um, uh, kind of limitation is the presence of the, the bony pelvis, which, you know, using ultrasound, which is based on sound waves, it, it can be a tough medium for the, the ultrasound to go through and collect really great images. Um, though there's definitely still still role for, for ultrasound and abdominal staging for these cases. You know, advanced imaging has been shown to detect a greater number of enlarged lymph nodes compared to, to ultrasound as well. So I think this, this publication really kind of gets to the heart of that, um, kind of comparing abdominal ultrasound versus CT scan for abdominal staging for Agasaka. You know, 20 dogs were evaluated in this study um, with, with Agasaka of which CT identified 13 having enlarged lymph nodes. Ultrasound was really useful in identifying at least one enlarged lymph nodes in 100% of those cases, which is great. However, only a third of the cases with ultrasound identified all the same enlarged lymph nodes as did the CT scan. So I think what I take away from this paper is that ultrasound can be an effective screening tool for the detection of enlarged or potentially metastatic lymph nodes. However, CT scans should be really considered in cases where, you know, finding one versus two enlarged lymph nodes is really important for, for case management. So, you know, far and away, um, surgery is, is really one of the big mainstays of treatment for Agasaka, particularly if you have non-metastatic disease. Um, it can also be considered as a treatment for dogs with local regional metastatic um, disease as well. <clears throat> surgery can be challenging for a bunch of reasons, um, particularly based on the location of the anal sacs with respect to the rectum, external anal sphincter, and kind of the peritoneal uh, neurovascular structures. That said, a lot of these tumors, particularly if you catch them smaller, um, can be resected relatively um, with low risks and low risk of postoperative complication. And a lot of times the risk is potentially related to the, the tumor size. We can also consider surgery for metastatic lymph nodes, and it definitely does improve outcomes in those cases, particularly if dogs are hypercalcemic or if the lymph nodes are causing obstruction of the, the pelvic canal. So multi-institutional retrospective study where 161 dogs were evaluated looking at post-operative complication rates following surgical resection of, of these dogs, and the overall complication rate was found to be 17%. In those cases, two thirds were found to be um, grade two or higher, meaning they're, they're complications that required kind of additional intervention. 7% um, of cases had intraoperative complications, um, which uh, anorectal perforation was, was um, the most common one seen. And 12% of all cases had surgical site infections. 18% of, of these dogs developed local recurrence at a median of 374 days and vascular and lymphatic invasion was associated with the increased risk of local recurrence. So um, here's a, a really interesting study that, that came out of UC Davis, looking at a very particular subset of dogs with Agasaka, in particular looking at, at dogs with primary tumors less than 3.2 centimeters that didn't have any metastatic disease treated with surgery alone. So what's really um, interesting about this study is none of, the, none of these dogs had any sort of adjuvant therapy. And what was really cool about this study is they found that the median survival time was 1200 day, over 1,200 days with 20 to 25% developing local recurrence or metastatic disease at you know, over a year or so, which is, is pretty significant. Um, and it, it suggests that while not every dog may have good long-term outcomes, that a lot of dogs may benefit with just surgery alone for these small non-metastatic, you know, anal sac adenocarcinomas. Also, um, cellular pleomorphism was associated with the uh, development of metastatic disease in this study. So here's what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve um, from this publication. 
And what this is looking at, something called the disease-free um, progression or the time it took for the tumor to grow back or spread, as well as something called the overall survival rate. And you know, you can see here kind of graphically that you know the average dog went on to live, you know, or went on to be disease-free for you know a really kind of long period of time, you know, close to probably 800 to 900 days, while the median survival time, like I mentioned, was 1,200 days or so. So some pretty, um, you know, for a veterinary study, a relatively well-powered study with some pretty interesting findings. So um, another uh, fun thing to bring up to a group of veterinary medical oncologists, the, the role of chemotherapy for Agasacas. And it's really not been fully defined. Um, to, just to mention, there's, there's no well-designed study showing a survival advantage for the use of adjuvant chemotherapy, meaning, you know, after removal of a, you know, non particularly non-metastatic uh, you know, anal sac tumor, there hasn't been any great data to show that it delays the time it takes for the tumor to grow back or spread. You know, certainly from a theoretical perspective, it makes sense that chemotherapy is indicated based on the high metastatic rate. Um, however, you know, we're just kind of lacking really strong data to support its use. Um, there have been various drugs that have been demonstrated with anti-tumor activity in the gross disease setting, you know, including carboplatin, cisplatin, and actinomycin D. Um, and in the post-operative setting, mitosantrone and melphalan have also been evaluated. But, you know, further data is definitely needed here, and there are definitely, you know, two main camps. Um, but uh, definitely an area where further research is needed. What is kind of neat, over the last few years, there's been kind of an emergence of a few publications looking at palladia for the treatment of kind of more advanced anal sac cases. And this was a really neat study where these were only dogs with um, distant metastatic lesions. And granted, not the largest study out of the UK, it was 15 cases in this JAVMA study, but um, they found that 87% of dogs had a clinical benefit and when, when we say clinical benefit, what that kind of means is either the tumor had stable disease or stayed the, the same size for, you know, on the order of three to four months or, or greater, um, and, or it had a partial response or shrank by greater than 30% or a complete response where it completely went away. So um, this study is pretty neat. It, it showed that 87% had stable disease. Um, however, it was a pretty durable response where, where their, you know, advanced stage cancer stayed pretty stable. So you know, the, the average time it took for the tumor to either grow or spread to new sites and, and the overall survival time was both around a year. So there's, there's some thoughts that may be related to some different growth factor receptors um, in, inhibition by the drug, um, but I think um, it, it definitely is a new kind of tool in our toolbox to, to use in these cases. Uh, a kind of complementary study by Dr. Pan out of the University of Wisconsin, retrospective study looking at dogs with Agasaka treated with Palladia as well. And they found that the clinical benefit, which again is the number of dogs with stable disease, partial responders and complete responses is about 70% with uh, about 20% having partial responses. So, you know, how I kind of phrase this to owner is if you have a case where the dog has a, a good quality of life and, and maybe more advanced stage disease, this is definitely an option to try to stabilize things some, and you can get lucky and, and they're definitely a subset that can have significant um, and durable kind of tumor shrinkage. The, the findings were somewhat similar to the other study where, you know, getting close to 10 to, 10 to 11 months or so until the tumor grew or spread. And interestingly, the overall survival time in the study was a little over two years or so. So um, in addition to chemotherapy and surgery, you know, radiation therapy is another kind of tool in the kit that we use for management of these cases. Definitely a well-described role in, in palliation um, for these cases with measurable responses between 40 and 75% of dogs when they're treated with a hypofractionated radiation protocol. And when I say hypofractionated, I mean, you know, four to eight treatments or so with a relatively high dose per fraction. Um, and we can see clinical improvements in the majority of these cases as well. And, and similar to Palladia, these tend to be pretty durable responses, you know, on the order of 10 to 12 months or so um, until the tumor grows or significantly spreads after radiation therapy. Often too, the, the side effect profile for these hypofractionated um, cases are, are pretty minimal with some dogs getting some low-grade colitis or some skin, skin issues as well. <clears throat> now, the, the role for radiation for definitive therapy, particularly, excuse me, in the micro 
microscopic disease setting is a little bit less well understood and probably an area where some further research is needed. <clears throat> so a few kind of studies just bringing that point home. This was a study where, you know, relatively large powered study of 77 dogs that were uh, retrospective in nature, treated with hypofractionated radiation therapy for the management of metastatic Agasaka. Um, one kind of downside of this study is the RT protocols were really variable. Um, so, so hard to, to say too much about that, but overall uh, a little over a third of cases had uh, pretty significant tumor shrinkage and 63% of dogs had improvement or resolution of clinical signs. One really interesting thing they looked at in this study was hypercalcemia. And in the cases that were hypercalcemic, 31% had resolution of the hypercalcemia with radiation therapy alone. While as with the addition of prednisone plus or minus a bisphosphonate, that went down to almost 50%, which is pretty, pretty interesting. And again, similar to what we just mentioned, these are pretty durable responses on the order of nine to 10 or nine to 11 months or so. And you can see here's another Kaplan-Meier curve with again, you know, survival on your Y axis uh, or the distribution or the percentage rather on the Y and the, the time on the X. You can see here, you know, your, your uh, kind of median survival when you go to the 0.5 and then where uh, the graph crosses there. So this was a, a pretty interesting study as well. Um, looking at the outcomes of dogs with a very specific stage tumor, which if you remember the stage 3B was when they had lymph node uh, metastatic disease that was greater than 4.5 centimeters. So kind of more advanced stage uh, lymph node metastatic lesions. Um, this was a retrospective study where dogs were treated with eight radiation treatments of 3.8 gray um, and versus dogs that were treated with surgery. Um, and interestingly, what they found is that dogs treated with surgery went on to, to have significantly better times than with respect to the time it took for the tumor to grow or spread compared to um, uh, surgery and radiation. So dogs had a significantly better outcome with radiation therapy. Also, both tended to have pretty quick improvement of clinical signs. So again, I think um, this may be the, the start of a conversation about, you know, these uh, more advanced staged cases that radiation may be advantageous over surgery. So again, here are some kind of Kaplan-Meier curves uh, comparing surgery to radiation therapy. You know, uh, I once heard this described as when you're evaluating two different treatments for something, usually you wanna be able to drive a truck through rather than being able to swipe a credit card. You know, the, the truck shows that there's a big enough difference between the two treatments to, to show real significance where a credit card you know, the, and the graphs are right on top of one another that it's not a significant difference. And I wouldn't say you could fit a truck through here, but you could fit, you know, maybe a European car or a handful of credit cards. So some, some difference probably starting to develop there. So that kind of ends the, our uh, cursory talk about anal sac adenocarcinoma in dogs, um, by no means the only um, tumor that we see in anal sacs in dogs. Uh, a less common but more aggressive tumor is uh, squamous cell carcinoma that can arise for whatever reason from the, the anal sac. Not a lot of really good data out there, but there was one pathologic study which showed, you know, four or five dogs that developed this were euthanized pretty quickly, secondary to, to local um, aggressiveness of the, the tumor. Um, we had a, a case here not long ago um, that was one of the text dogs that had a squamous cell carcinoma of the anal sac that unfortunately was pretty refractory to, to treatment and, and kind of echoed the findings from this small study. Another kind of interesting and, and rare tumor of the anal sacs is actually malignant melanoma. Um, there was a, a small case series published in JSAP where 11 dogs were identified um, that were treated with surgery, plus or minus chemo or the, the melanoma vaccine. The survival was only about three to four months or so, and almost all of these dogs were euthanized secondary to either local recurrence or, or metastasis of the tumor. It's kind of interesting. This is a, a case that actually developed a, a penile metastatic lesion. So you can see here, um, this penis obviously is all black from the, the melanoma spreading to that site. And here's just a, a graph from that study, and you can see the mitotic index and these tumors were all really hot, you know, kind of similar to the, the ones in the mouth and overall survival, unfortunately, was, was pretty low. So cats always, I feel like, it, unfortunately, the short end of the stick here, um, there is actually um, 
descriptions of anal sac tumors in, in cats and a, a multi-institutional study looking at cats with Agasaka. <clears throat> and um, the most common clinical sign noted in cats is actually perianal ulceration. And in this study where 30 cats were identified, a third developed local recurrence after about three months or so. And interestingly, here's a Kaplan-Meier curve comparing cats that had local recurrence um, uh, uh, incomplete surgery versus um, complete surgical excision. You can see the cats with incomplete surgical excision had a, a much shorter overall um, time to recurrence relative. On average, these cats lived about seven to eight months or so. So they can do okay and, and probably an area where some more uh, data is needed, but just interesting to keep cats in mind as well for Agasakas. So just to, to circle back here to, to Mr. Winston, um, Interestingly, his primary tumor was, was shrinking pretty significantly while on the Palladia over the course of a few months. And in January, he went down to 2.6 centimeters when it had been about four centimeters and then shrank down to two centimeters in, in February. Also his ionized calcium levels kind of stayed pretty normal, um, which was great to see um, after the zolidronate and, and being started on the Palladia. And we actually have started to since taper his prednisone down um, some as well. Um, also, it was really cool. We repeated an ultrasound here in the middle of February and his sacral lymph nodes as well as his prepucial lymph nodes um, have, have shrunk significantly. So you can see here what they were in parentheses back in um, December versus now, you know, they're maybe 30 to 40% or so smaller, which is uh, pretty promising. So I think um, wrapped up maybe a few minutes earlier there than I expected. Um, any questions on the perianal tumors uh, before we jump into the next ones? Dr. Cook, I have a question. Oh, hi, Dr. Koritz. Hi. Um, I have a question about zoledronate administration, actually, and mostly from a practical standpoint. Um, when you're in practice, are you leaving these guys on a pump or are you having slow push administration by a nurse or by you? A good question. We um, we are um, infusing the bag of sodium chloride and then putting it on a pump and leaving them hooked up to that for about 15 minutes. I'm not sure of any cases of extravasation with zolidronate. I'd have to look to see if it is an extravasant, um, but I haven't. I know that's the way I've, I've seen it done previously and the way I've done it before. I haven't been burned by it um, or heard otherwise, but it's a good question. See, and that's exactly what, what I've been, you know, kind of taught to do, but I think we're extrapolating from pomidronate in some cases, right? So pomidronate has been shown to be a vesicant in one study where they actually just looked at dogs. But I think it's an interesting thought because a lot of practices are giving it as a push by a nurse. And I just was curious if you've had any cases that you thought you were actually suspicious of extravasation or if anybody in the discussion has that. Not something I've seen before. I don't know if anybody else um, may have. It, I mean, it's interesting. A lot of, I think a lot of the substances we give, especially from an oncologic perspective are, are things that can cause extravasation. I mean, there's like carboplatin, which classically we really don't think of as a vesicant. There's a recent case series of seven dogs that I think it goes to show any sort of drug maybe outside of the vessel in, in large amounts can cause some perivascular damage and stuff. Thank you. And thanks for seeing Winston. Yeah, thank you for taking good care of him. <laughs> Any other questions or? Oh. Cool. Okay, so that's our first um, first hour, which hopefully we will also be able to to trudge on through and finish a little early tonight. So our our second topic here is urogenital tumors um, in dogs and cats. So um, another kind of interesting case I wanted to kind of. Um, talk about is this guy, Frankie. He's a seven-year-old male castrated lab mix who's super handsome, but kind of a demon at the same time. Um, he had hematuria and tenesmus and presented to his primary vet back in October. He had um, some prostata um, megaly observed at the primary vet at that time, as well as a suspect bladder tumor on the primary vet's ultrasound. 
and um, some baseline blood work was performed and it was um, within normal limits at that time. So he was then transferred over to oncology at MVS, um, at which time we did an abdominal ultrasound and a regularly marginated mass was observed in the apex of the bladder. Um, the prostate was also noted to be moderately enlarged and no enlarged abdominal lymph nodes were noted at that time. <clears throat> uh, chest radiographs were performed and no metastatic lesions were noted and a BRAF mutation test was performed and was found to be uh, positive with a fractional abundance of 39%. Um, he was started on carprofen as well at that time. You can see here is actually one of his ultrasonographic images and you can see he has a four centimeter prostatic mass present um, at that point. After we got his BRAF results back, we started him on vinblastine um, IV every 14 days. Uh, his third dose of vinblastine was administered on December 7th, and we then sent um, him out to North Carolina State uh, Veterinary Hospital to start radiation therapy. Um, he had an abdominal CT scan performed on December 13th, at which time they found an enlarged lymph node, which was aspirated and, and diagnosed as um, metastatic carcinoma. We then, um, he was started on uh, radiation therapy, which he had an IMRT or image uh, modulated radiation therapy set up. And he was given uh, 3.4 gray treat, um, dose over uh, per treatment and 15 total treatments, which was started on December 30th. So we'll, we'll revisit his case here at the end, but I wanna kind of start at the kidneys and move our way back to the, the bladder. So canine kidney tumors are an uncommon uh, primary tumor that are, that are seen. Um, there's a certain differential diagnosis when we see kidney tumors in dogs, which include renal adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, sarcoma, in particular um, hemangiosarcoma, transitional cell carcinoma, and um, uncommonly to rarely nephroblastoma, which is a, a tumor that we can see in, in young dogs in the kidneys in particular. Um, some clinical signs that are noted um, or that can be seen in, in cases of renal tumors in dogs are hematuria, um, pain on palpation, and nonspecific clinical signs. So uh, this was a, a pretty seminal study looking at primary renal tumors in dogs out of the University of Missouri. In this study, 82 cases were identified of which carcinomas were most common. Uh, sarcomas were the second most common group, making up about a third of the cases and then uh, nephroblastoma as being the least common. Interestingly, uh, presence of pain on abdominal palpation was more associated with sarcomas in this study. The mean age of dogs was eight years old, 4% of cases had bilateral disease, and pulmonary metastasis was present in 16% of dogs at the time of diagnosis versus 77% of dogs at the time of euthanasia. The median survival time was um, kind of related to the primary tumor type, unsurprisingly, where carcinomas lived on average 16 months, sarcoma nine months, and nephroblastomas about six months. So in, in dogs with renal tumors, uh, the diagnostics we'll often consider are you know, baseline blood work and a urinalysis, chest radiographs, some form of abdominal imaging for staging, fine needle aspirate to um, try to figure out, cytologically speaking, what's going on. Um, in some academic institutions, they will actually also consider scintigraphy um, just to try to figure out the, the function of the quote unquote good kidney that's um, not affected by the tumor if surgery is on the table. Um, some laboratory findings that we'll see in dogs with uh, kidney tumors include mild to moderate anemia, um, hypoalbuminemia, hypercalcemia, uh, elevated ALP, and on occasion, perineoplastic polycythemia. So um, some folks have looked at different imaging findings, in particular with CT scan to try to help differentiate renal cell carcinoma from lymphoma and hemangiosarcoma. Um, they found that uh, renal cell carcinomas often appear more heterogeneous and are usually unilateral, unsurprisingly, with vessel enhancement being observed, whereas uh, renal lymphomas are more hot, homogeneous and tend to be bilateral and have multiple masses being involved. So again, here you can see a case of a renal carcinoma versus a renal lymphoma. And you can see kind of the multiple nodules and the being bilateral for lymphoma versus unilateral for um, renal carcinoma. 
Interestingly, too, with renal lymphoma, in this study, they found a relatively low dose or low incidence, rather, of lymphadenopathy, which is a little unusual. You know, with, you know, I would think with lymphoma, you'd be more inclined to see in large lymph nodes in the, the abdomen, which they didn't necessarily find in this study. So when we talk about treatment of, of renal tumors in dogs, it's really important to try to determine if we're dealing with a lymphoma, which is often treated with chemotherapy and kind of carries a guarded to, to poor prognosis versus renal carcinoma or sarcoma, where typically they're treated with the nephrectomy plus or minus adjunctive chemotherapy. Here's somebody holding a renal tumor. And in case you didn't know, it's tumor based on the label there. So there's a relatively recent study looking at presumed primary renal lymphoma in dogs. Um, all these cases presented clinically ill. The majority of them, similar to the CT study, kind of that was aforementioned, had bilateral renal lesions present. Uh, about half of dogs responded to chemotherapy. However, to the point I made a few slides ago, the overall survival time was 10 days. And it speaks to the fact that, you know, they're presenting sick and, and often tend to have either no response or have a transient response to chemotherapy. And dogs that didn't respond to chemo lived about 10 days, whereas dogs who did respond to chemotherapy only lived a little over a month, again, speaking to the kind of aggressive nature of this disease. And in case you were curious graphically how that looked, you can see here um, dogs that didn't respond to chemo versus dogs that, that did. So uh, there's also a small retrospective study looking at dogs with renal hemangiosarcoma, not very common, but we will see these cases on occasion. Um, in this study, dogs were treated with nephrectomy plus or minus chemotherapy, you know, for which doxorubicin was most commonly used. The median survival time was eight months or so, and the one-year survival was 31%. Um, in this study, having a hemoabdomen was found to be a, a poor prognostic indicator. Um, and again, here's just a Kaplan-Meier curve showing that uh, those outcomes. So uh, this was a histopathologic study by Dr. Bard Powers looking at the prognostic significance um, of different histopathologic features in dogs with renal cell carcinoma. It was a pretty big study, you know, including about seven, uh, 70 cases. The overall median survival time was close to two years, which you know goes to show that that dog with renal renal tumors, in particular renal carcinomas, can have pretty good outcomes. And this study really showed that the number of actively dividing cells was a really good uh, prognostic indicator for these cases. You know, in dogs where the mitotic index or the number of actively dividing cells was greater than 30, dogs lived about six months, um, whereas if that number was less than 10, they went on to live over three years. So again, um, at least in renal tumors, the mitotic index does appear to be um, prognostically important. Uh, they also looked at various um, histologic subtypes. Um, the one that really seemed the most uh, germane was this clear cell carcinoma, which similar to people carries a, a pretty aggressive um, disease course and, and poor prognosis. Again, not to, to feel like we leave cats out. Um, there is a, a study looking at primary renal tumors in cats. Uh, renal lymphoma is more common, but other tumors are rare. In this study, um, also out of the University of Missouri, they had 13 cases of renal carcinoma that were identified. Um, and the most common clinical sign with these primary renal tumors that weren't lymphoma were, were weight, uh, weight loss. And the metastatic rate was about 64%, so pretty high. Uh, also recently, there was a study looking at just cases with uh, renal lymphoma in cats, which relative is a, a pretty uncommon to rare version of, of lymphoma. Um, half the cats in this case series had multicentric disease or, or disease and other kind of organs within the abdomen. And similar to dogs, the, the, unfortunately, these cats didn't do very well. With steroids alone, they lived about two months versus you know, L-CHOP chemotherapy, a little over six months. So um, again, just unfortunately, a little bit of an aggressive disease in, in cats as well as dogs. So to, to move forward from the, the kidneys, we'll now transition to talking a little bit about um, the, the bladder. So um, canine bladder tumors make up about 2% of all malignancies in dogs. Uh, you'll notice I'm going to use um, transitional cell carcinoma and invasive urothelial cell carcinoma interchangeably. You know, the new, um, the, the new wave of pathologists really are pushing this urothelial carcinoma since Maybe it's a little bit more um, specific a name, but we'll, we'll use both interchangeably. Uh, 
while far and away, these are the most common tumors we see in the bladder of dogs. Certainly there, there are various other tumors that can arise from the bladder, including squamous cell carcinoma, undifferentiated carcinoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, lymphoma, um, hemangiosarcoma, and other kind of various mesenchymal tumors. Uh, folks have identified some clear risk factors for development of these urothelial carcinomas, including a, a really strong breed risk um, or associated breed risk, uh, females being significantly overrepresented relative to males, um, dogs that are obese, um, exposure to older generation flea control products or lawn chemicals, and previous um, cyclophosphamide exposure, more so maybe in, in people than in dogs, but to a lesser degree dogs. And here you can see um, a cut section of a dog with a really gnarly looking uh, bladder tumor. So um, this is definitely one of the diseases where we keep a close eye on the breed of the dog because there are some really classic uh, players here like your Scotties, your Shelties, your Westies, your Quiche Hounds, Beagles, Dalmatians. Um, those are, are really your big breeds. And you can see here the, the, um, the risk or the odds ratio for Scottish Terriers is crazy high relative to some of these other, you know, also pretty common breeds. So again, definitely uh, dog breeds to keep a close eye on here. So some common clinical signs we can see these dogs present with include hematuria, dysuria, plaquiuria. You know, they can have kind of concurrent and non-resolving urinary tract infections. And in less common cases, things like bone metastasis or, or um, in one study that we'll maybe mention here at the end, about 55% of dogs developed at least one TUI, one uh, urinary tract infection on culture um, in dogs with this transitional cell carcinoma. On physical exam, it's good to, to be cognizant of, of palpating for urethral thickening, prostata megaly, or, or feeling for a distended bladder. Um, again, so maybe non-cancerous differential diagnosis to consider are those other, the kind of laundry list of other tumors we saw. Um, polypoid cystitis, which you can see here some, some old school ultrasonographic images of some polypoid um, cystitis lesions, uh, granulomatous cystitis, glossy bio, uh, bio, biopomas, and inflammatory pseudotumors. So um, when we're uh, kind of talking about workup for bladder mass, some, some diagnostics we'll, we'll recommend are baseline um, lab work, plus or minus a urine culture and a UA. Uh, chest radiographs, some sort of abdominal imaging, whether you know, ultrasound or CT scan. And then some things we can consider are doing things like a urine cytology. It's a, a test we don't often do, but we can sometimes actually spin down the urine sample and, and do a cytologic evaluation of the sediment. Maybe in about a third of, of cases, you can actually get a diagnosis or you know, lean towards a diagnosis with that. Um, the, the big kind of limitation with that is if there's any significant inflammatory component present as well, it can make it really hard to differentiate, you know, uh, kind of dysplastic changes secondary to inflammation versus presence of a true neoplastic population. Um, additionally, BRAF mutation testing, which we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, and also histopathology, which, you know, kind of remains the gold standard for diagnosis. So here you can see, you know, kind of marked um, uh, neutrophilic inflammation, but this kind of cluster of these epithelial cells. And here you can see kind of a, a eosinophilic inclusion in one of these, which is called the Malamed Walinska body, which one of my uh, intern mates affectionately used to call the, um, what's her name, the Hillary Lewinsky or the Monica Lewinsky bodies, um, which he thought he was funny for what it's worth. So um, just to, to talk maybe a little bit about BRAF um, in dogs. BRAF is a effector molecule on what's called the RASREF ERK uh, MEK pathway, um, which under normal circumstances, you have a, a growth factor bind to this receptor, or the EGFR, which leads to um, phosphorylation of RAS, which goes down this pathway to activate ERK, leading in normal cells to growth survival and cellular proliferation. Uh, for whatever reason, we have constitutive activation of this BRAF molecule leading to a cascade of events and, and thereby oncogenic growth and proliferation of these cells inappropriately. Um, and, and as we'll talk about in your genital tumors in dogs, this BRAF mutation is really a key driver for, for the majority of these cases. So interestingly in people, um, BRAF is a common mutation present in, in cases of melanoma, 
um, particularly in valine of, of, of the, the valine 600 of BRAF. In contrast, in dogs, it's uh, the constitutive activation is in the V595, um, and it's present in 70 to 80 percent of, of dogs with bladder tumors and prostatic carcinomas. And interestingly, in one study, was not found to be present in any dogs with um, cystitis. It's also been described in dogs with melanoma and glioma. This is interesting. It's a PET CT in a, a human patient with melanoma, and you can see here kind of how the melanoma is distributed kind of all throughout and metastasized all throughout the body. And they went ahead and actually started a BRAF inhibitor. You can see how dramatic the, the response is after treatment. So as a lot of you guys are probably familiar, there, this BRAF testing is, is out there and available now through Antec. Um, if, if you guys call over to Antec, if they're not your primary lab, or even if they are, they'll typically be kind enough to send over these, what they call collection pots and little um, submission forms. Uh, the goal is if to collect 30, at least 30 milliliters of urine if there's an overt bladder mass on imaging versus 40 milliliters more so if there's no overt bladder mass and to add it to the collection pot, which is kept at room temperature. One nice thing is you can actually add cereal samples to this. The big thing they want you to do is to swirl it in the collection pot so that the sample mixes with the diluent in these little bottles. And like I said, you can add cereal sampling. Um, you know, if say you have a clinical concern for a case of, of being a TCC and the, the BRAF is negative, which can be present in 30% in or so of these cases of TCC, you know, typically cystoscopy and biopsy is recommended to, to garner a definitive diagnosis. So um, this is actually from Frank Yee's case and how these are kind of reported out here. So they'll um, tell you whether or not the mutation is present, which in Frank Yee it was. Another kind of interesting thing is they'll actually give you a quantification of the percent of cells with the mutation or the, and as well as the fractional abundance. It's kind of interesting because as we're starting to learn more about this, it's, it, it's starting to seem that the, you, know, you actually need to have a significant number of these cells have the mutation for this finding to be significant. Um, at least based on some preliminary data shared by Dr. Debbie Knapp at a, a conference we had last fall. So, so stay tuned. I think this, this may be revisited some, but um, I'm starting to lean towards looking more at this percentage of cells and wanting to see it be, be elevated before I uh, slam dunk call one of these guys a, a TCC based on a BRAF. So um, then kind of just to, to dive in topographically and, and start to discuss, you know, where exactly are these tumors located within the bladder? So 78% of cases are reported to actually invade into the bladder wall, where a, um, a fifth of cases invade into kind of neighboring organs in the area. A little over 50% have disease present within the urethra. And in male dogs, about a third have disease extension into the prostate. Um, one kind of interesting kind of thing to note is at the time of diagnosis, only about 15% of these dogs will have nodal and distant metastasis present, where at the time of death, close to 60% will develop distant metastatic lesions. You know, really the, the primary focus and of, of these guys' diagnos diagnosis and treatment is on management of the local disease. But, you know, sometimes when you do a really good job and they live longer than expected, you know, the, these guys will start to develop issues secondary to kind of more distant um, metastatic lesions. So kind of a newer paper published in BCO by a Japanese group where dogs with TCC had full body CT scans performed. And what was really interesting and, and maybe um, or, or took me aback reading this is how high the percentage of distant metastatic lesions are at the time of diagnosis. You know, in this study, almost 50% had iliosacral lymphadenopathy or, or lymph node, you know, concern for lymph node mets, where, you know, a third had lung mets and 20% and had sternal lymphadenopathy, which is not a, a common site I, I think about these tumors, you know, spreading to. So I think it, it just kind of brings home the importance of one, you know, really being uh, more open-minded and, and really staging these dogs with thoracic and abdominal imaging, um, but also the, the idea of stage migration or as our staging test gets better, we're going to start to detect smaller lesions in, in other areas of the body potentially sooner. Also, an interesting finding is that dogs with uh, urethral disease had a higher percentage or higher risk of having bone uh, mets and lung mets compared to dogs that just were located in the bladder. So again, in cases where disease is truly urethral, maybe being a little bit more um, 
uh, aware of this. Also the survival, maybe unsurprisingly in dogs with urethral disease was about four months, whereas dogs with bladder disease went on to live over a year. So again, here's a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, just showing the difference of dogs that had disease in their bladder versus um, disease uh, located in their urethra. <clears throat> and you can see here that tumor localization as well as um, presence or of bone, uh, bone spread or sternal lymph node spread was, was really associated with overall outcomes in this uh, group of dogs. So when we talk about um, treatment options for these cases, you know, it's really linked to what the, the distribution of disease is. So the first question I always ask myself is, is the tumor in the apex or the body of the bladder? Um, if the tumor is in the apex or the, the area not uh, located in the trigone or this common junction site, you know, surgery is, is potentially an option on the table with um, typically with uh, post-op uh, non-steroidals and long-term NSAID use, um, plus or minus chemotherapy. You know, with surgery, while it's an option, um, there's a very high risk of local recurrence, and that's secondary to something called the field cancerization effect. So what happens is the, the tumor sheds its cancer cells into the urine, which then bathes the rest of the bladder in these cancer cells. So even if you remove a gross tumor, the, the chances of it growing back in another area of the bladder is, is pretty much assured and unfortunately secondary to that. Though it, it you know, doing surgery may buy the dog more comfortable time, uh, you know, urine, urinating. Also with surgery, it's important just to be really cautious of, um, you know, the fact that even small samples of the, the tumor that are dropped um, intraoperatively can lead to tumor seeding at the time of surgery. And um, definitely have seen, unfortunately, a, a already a decent number of dogs that have subcutaneous um, seeding from, from surgery of these cases. So um, if the, the tumor's in the trigone, you know, what our, our treatment options look like or uses of a, an NSAID or COX-2 inhibitor, typically I'll quote people that, that these cases will live somewhere between three to six months on average. Um, use of a COX-2 inhibitor plus some form of, of systemic therapy like chemotherapy. Um, typically, I'll quote most people somewhere between six and 10 months. Um, there, you know, there's a whole lot of options for, for chemo. Usually that means one's not markedly better than any of the others. Um, though we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute here. Um, radiation therapy with an NSAID and chemotherapy where the, the median survival time goes up to about a year when, when all three are used together. And then we'll mention a little bit about urethral or ureteral stenting. So um, this was a, a, an interesting study coming out of Colorado State University looking at um, dogs that had um, apical bladder disease or apical bladder um, transitional cell carcinoma treated with a partial cystectomy um, and an NSAID plus or minus chemotherapy. And uh, they found that dogs with surgery followed by um, those treatments lived close to a year on, on average, which is significant. Um, though you can see the time it took for the tumor to grow back or spread was maybe closer to eight months. Um, what's interesting is they found with partial cystectomy followed with daily paroxicam, um, that, that almost doubled. Um, so again, I think um, just a good example where, where surgery is, is certainly has a, a role for some of these cases in dogs where the primary tumor seems amenable to, to surgical excision. Um, COX-2 inhibitors are obviously one of the mainstays and, and arguably maybe the, the best treatment we have for these cases. Um, you know, you have a mixture of non-selective um, COX inhibitors like paroxicam versus more COX-2 selective inhibitors. Um, you know, uh, daricoxib and furacoxib along with paroxicam have been the most evaluated and partial remissions have been seen in 15 to 20 percent of dogs treated with um, uh, these uh, COX-2 inhibitors. Um, and stable disease has been reported in around 55% of cases for a period of time. Um, depending on where you're, you're trained, some people are maybe more purists that they feel that the kind of seminal literature has been evaluated looking at paroxicam and daricoxib. Um, I, I was kind of trained a little bit differently where, you know, there hasn't been really any good evidence to show that one end is better than another. So typically, um, whatever end set the clinician's most comfortable using is often what I'll, I'll um, advocate for. Um, but, but again, certainly Proxicam and, and, and these other COX-2 inhibitors have really been the most thoroughly evaluated. <clears throat> Just some things to keep an eye out with Proxicam are things like GI upset and GI ulceration um, seen in, in some of those cases. <clears throat> 
So this is a, a really busy table. And um, having recently taken boards, it, it really was a, a bear to try to remember a lot of the nuanced details from this. Um, but this is in our kind of Withrow, which is the cancer textbook for dogs and cats. And um, you can see all the different chemotherapy drugs that have been evaluated for TCC in dogs and their response rates. I'm gonna bring your attention to probably the, the two that Dr. Vansel and I use most commonly um, off the bat, which are benblastine and mitoxantrone. You can see here, at least in this study with an NSAID plus um, benblastine, partial response uh, when it's given every two weeks around 58%, whereas with mitoxantrone, you know, 35% or so had an objective response. So, um, you know, as, as you guys have probably sent cases to, to various medical oncologists, you know, Palladia has been, has been used quite a bit and, and there's, it's nice there's starting to be some more literature looking at Palladia for the treatment of various tumors. Um, and, and while it's helpful in, in cases like Agasaka, um, this, this study from Barb Biller out of CSU um, evaluated dogs with transitional cell carcinoma. Um, interestingly, a pretty small um, objective response rate. However, stable disease was noted in, in the majority of cases for about four months or so. One uh, pretty interesting finding in, in this study was actually over half of dogs developed progressive azotemia for, um, while they were on Palladia. Now, while these dogs were really heavily pretreated, and, and some of that could have certainly been post-renal um, from urinary obstruction, um, it is interesting that the number is higher than some other studies that have looked at uh, chemo treatments in really heavily pretreated dogs with TCC. So, um, not not something that we're really commonly reaching for, though. Certainly, could be considered in, in the right case. Um, something that that we I use maybe a little bit more commonly um, from this group out of uh, Purdue is actually looking at metronomic chlorambucil administration for dogs with um, TCC. And um, in this study where they were given uh, four mg per meter squared um, uh, daily, again, in a very heavily pretreated population, it's about 70% of dogs <clears throat> actually had a clinical benefit um, where again, the majority of those were a stabilization of disease on average of about four months. In contrast with the uh, Palladia though, this was really well tolerated in this population of dogs. And, and I think only one or two had to be um, taken off of therapy for, for stomach upset. So again, you know, an option to consider if injectable chemotherapy isn't an option um, or, or owners aren't able to pursue that for whatever reason. <clears throat> so um, this is a, a really cool study. You know, I showed the, the PET CT scan of the, the person with um, melanoma and the, the BRAF inhibitor. Um, this was a phase one and <clears throat> phase two clinical trial. Excuse me. looking at um, a BRAF inhibitor in, in dogs with TCC, particularly BRAF mutated TCC. And, um, you know, it was a pretty well tolerated drug in this study with <clears throat> the most common side effect being anorexia. The objective response rate was close to 40% and they were, um, they, they required greater than 50% tumor shrinkage to actually define it as an objective response. <clears throat> Unfortunately, similar to what they see in people with BRAF inhibitors, the tumors are very quick to become resistant um, to the, the drug. So the duration of response was only about six months. One interesting drug specific side effect, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, they can develop these kind of photodynamic cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas or papillomas associated with therapy. Again, better worked out in people, but just kind of an unusual side effect. Um, seen with this drug in particular. This is what's called a waterfall plot. So this is showing the, the cases in the aforementioned study and showing the change in tumor volume, um, which I just realized they spelled change wrong, but um, you can see here the cutoff of 50% um, and the majority of these dogs <coughs> having tumor shrinkage um, with, with treatment. I'm getting all choked up talking about bladder tumors. So um, this was a, a pretty large recent study looking at radiation therapy in conjunction with mitoxantrone and a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory in dogs. And what was cool about this study, it was a relatively large powered study, including 51 dogs. <clears throat> 
and it was fairly uniform in, in treatment. And what was cool is when, when all three of these treatments were <clears throat> administered together, they found that the overall or the median survival time was about a year and a half or so um, with event-free survival or the time until the dogs developed either metastatic disease or, or local progression being around eight months. So um, they did find if there was prostatic involvement of disease, um, dogs would have um, shorter survivals or if unsurprisingly their clinical signs were a lot worse. One really interesting and not really well reported um, clinical phenomenon noted in this study was the presence of permanent urinary incontinence, which was observed in about a third of dogs. And <clears throat> it's not something that we commonly think about or talk about, but um, with radiation, it's, it's something now that I know folks out at NC State and at some other institutions are starting to be more kind of in, in tune to. Um, urethral stenting is, is also an option. It's typically considered what's called a salvage procedure, meaning it's something to, to be considered to try to provide some short-term palliation. Um, this has been looked at in a handful of studies. In this one study from JAVMA from 2012, <clears throat> the reported median survival time was two months or so, um, you know, putting this fluoroscopically, introducing this um, stent here into the urethra to try to um, ameliorate some of the obstruction. Some complications associated with urethral stenting include incontinence, reobstruction from the tumor continuing to grow over the, sprint, the stent, obviously the stent becoming infected or sometimes the stent, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, can also migrate here in the urethra. Um, unfortunately, it's not something we're doing here in Nashville, but um, some different folks up in the Northeast or Midwest um, do have the capabilities of doing some fluoroscopic stent placement. This was a, a pretty, pretty neat study out of Japan um, looking at balloon dilation for the treatment of uh, urethral obstruction. And they had 12 of these cases of which nine actually had improvement when they introduced this kind of balloon catheter into the urethra with the, the tumor and dilated it. And some of them were fairly durable, you know, ranging from 50 to 300 days. Um, unsurprisingly, they, they can have some transient complications, including um, blood in the urine, urinary incontinence, or dysuria. I, um, I briefly brought this up to the, some of the internists, and, and they looked at me like, we're not doing that. But kind of at least theoretically, if, if nothing else, an interesting option to, uh, to consider. Um, it didn't seem, and interestingly, none of them seemed to develop a urethral tear, which... Um, I would certainly be concerned about. Um, as I mentioned, uh, urinary tract infections are unsurprisingly also commonly seen in these dogs. <clears throat> and at least in one study out of the University of California at Davis, 55% had at least one positive urinary culture. These were much more common in female dogs and it was much more common in dogs with <clears throat> urethral extent, um, extension of their disease. Uh, the most common organisms were Staphylococcus and E. coli. Again, not to, to leave cats out, there was this kind of newer study looking at a, almost 120 cases. One interesting difference with the signalment of cats is these are really a lot of uh, really older cats with a median age at the time of diagnosis of 15. Um, the, the presence of trigonal disease is its most common location, but less common compared to their canine counterparts. 21% were noted to have metastatic disease present, and the median survival time for all cats in this study was 155 days. Um, though you can imagine, and this graph shows, unsurprisingly, if you did no treatment, you didn't do as well as if you did treatment with um, cystectomy or more kind of advanced treatments. And then just to, to finish up here and circle back to Mr. Frankie, Mr. Frankie um, completed his radiation therapy at NC State back in January <clears throat> and is doing great at home. Uh, we restarted his chemotherapy back in February. Um, he's not having any lower urinary tract signs, though strangely he's continuing to have this kind of intermittent diarrhea that we're still working on trying to get control of. And our plan is to repeat a CT scan about three months after radiation just to see how his tumor is responding to treatment. <clears throat> 